G'day folks, Ziggy here with my first guide for Blight League. I've seen a lot of questions about the Blight encounters, towers and Blight maps, so in this video I'll go over how it all works and some strategies that have been working well for me. The first and most important thing to know is the resistance mechanic. When you start a Blight encounter, above the pump's health bar on your UI is a series of gate symbols. Inside of these are symbols showing what that lane will be resistant to. A lot of people have been confusing this for weaknesses, there are actually no explicit weaknesses on Blight monsters, but resistances are important. If a gate has a fire symbol, those monsters will be fire type and will be resistant to fire tower damage. If they have a purple minion symbol, they will ignore the minions from your summoning towers and so on. A mixture of tower types is always a good idea, but if there are a lot of gates resistant to a particular type, you'll want to build very few of those towers. It's worth noting that you can also see this resistance symbol on the map and above the gate itself, so you can plan your tower placement accordingly. The next aspect of the UI that is important to know is the bosses. Sometimes there will be a symbol above a gate on the UI that looks a bit like a blighted pustule. This shows that the gate will spawn a boss at some point during the encounter. When the symbol is grey, the boss is not currently on the map, but when the symbol is gold, the boss is active and you should hunt it down. Bosses have a lot of HP and do a chunk of damage to the pump, so stopping them is paramount. You can see their golden symbol on the overlay map as well when they're active. The final UI symbol is the times 2 symbol below the gates. This means that you'll get two of the same chest rewards from that gate, extra juicy. And I also suspect that that gate itself may be harder, but I'm not 100% sure. Blight monsters in most cases will follow their paths, so even if there is a gate near the pump, the path probably loops around a bit before heading to the pump, so pay attention to where this is, you can check it out on the overlay map. Make sure to follow these paths on the map and see where they converge, as multiple converging paths create natural choke points to concentrate your towers. For most regular Blight encounters, the strategy is fairly simple. You'll mostly be using low tier towers and not really going for the final upgrades as the encounters just simply aren't long enough. You're better off spamming a bunch of low tier towers than hoarding points for the big upgrades. Minion summoning tower spam is very effective unless there is several lanes resistant to minions. Otherwise a mixture of summoning, ice and shock towers works great if your build is putting out good damage. If your damage is a bit lacking however, working in a couple fire towers with tier 2 or 3 upgrades will do the trick. Most regular blight encounters will be fairly easy with just low tier tower spam, with the occasional boss being handled with some concentrated tier 2 or 3 tower combos. Make sure to concentrate your upgraded towers on any natural choke points that arise and apply your own damage in these locations as the enemies bunch up. Now before I talk about the blighted maps, which are much, much more difficult, let's talk about the tower types and upgrades. Tier 1 through 3 summoning towers are fantastically strong and summon a pack of zombie-like minions with high HP. These minions run forwards to meet incoming blight enemies and blight monsters will stop to fight them unless they have the minion resistance. Summoning towers are probably the best at holding back the flow of enemies in lanes overall. The two upgrades either create a high HP golem or a pack of 10 flying snipers that do high damage over a long range. My strategy is typically to stick with tier 3 summoning towers to hold down a lane, and then I position some sniper minions further back if I want some extra damage. The ice towers do light damage and chill, thus slowing a limited number of enemies. These are solid in combination with other towers and cause blight lanes to group up, which can be good for AoE damage. They have a short range on them, so put them close to choke points where you want enemies to group up. One of the two final upgrades creates an ice spear which pierces that does pretty high damage. I found this one to be not too useful, though with good positioning it could do a lot of damage overall. The far more useful upgrade however is the Ice Prison, which creates a wall locking in enemies for a fairly long duration. This does an incredible job of locking down bosses and blight enemy packs for a long time, allowing your other towers to kill them, or for yourself to kill them. They do no damage themselves, but they are a crucial tool in the harder blighted maps. The physical towers do very little damage, but they stun enemies, slowing them a little bit. These can be decent in an area with a lot of blight lanes converging, but the main reason to build physical towers is for their final upgrades, both of which are fantastic in blight maps. Stony Gaze Tower beams enemies and eventually freezes them still. These are super crucial for stopping bosses dead in their tracks and giving you time to kill them since they have such high HP. They have a pretty large targeting range on the Stony Gaze, so you can kind of scatter them around pretty easily to lock down key enemies. The other upgrade is a large persistent slowing bubble, which is better at slowing down large hordes of regular enemies. I use stony gaze towers more overall because of the large threat that bosses pose, but the AoE slow is good when you have a lot of other towers concentrated in that area. 
Those three tower sets, summoning, ice, and physical, are probably the most important overall, since they just lock down enemies and give you a chance to kill them yourself. Without good use of these three towers, you'll be pretty quickly rolled over in blighted maps. That said, all of the following towers are also a bit important too in certain situations. The Lightning Tower, for example, creates shocked ground in a small area. The shock ground increases damage the enemies take, so these are best used in tight choke points in collaboration with other towers. One of the final upgrades creates an Arc Tower, which does some decent damage, but I've found these to be limited in effectiveness overall. The other upgrade is a large AoE Lightning Storm with decent damage but erratic targeting. These are pretty decent when combined with area slowing towers that group up large amounts of enemies. To be honest, I mainly stick with the shocked ground, upgrading it enough to cover the area of a kill box where I want the enemies to group up. The buffing tower amplifies the effects of towers in a large area. It's a bit hard to tell how good this is, but theoretically the more towers in its area, the more it'll be doing for you. The two final upgrade options either buff allies or debuff enemies. I'm not sure exactly the nature of the debuff on enemies, so it's hard to tell how good this is. I couldn't find any info on that. The Imbuing Tower, however, buffs allies such as you and your minions with attack, move, and cast speed. This is likely very good on summoner builds if you're playing one of those. Just place one in an area where you find yourself standing to fight for the majority of the fight. It's definitely worth making at least one of these if you're a summoner in a blighted map. The final tower type is the Fire Tower, which shoots fireballs in a fairly long range. Upgrades make it shoot more fireballs, and they do fairly good damage overall. The main problem with the Fireball Tower is that they get hard countered by proximity shields, and in the Blighted Maps there ends up being quite a few of these. The two final upgrades are a Meteor, which does high damage in a small AoE, but can be cast at long ranges, or a Flamethrower Tower which has short range from the tower, but does some decent persistent AoE damage. Flamethrower Tower in a good choke point with slows and ice prisons are fantastic, and counter proximity bubble shields if the tower is within the bubble. I don't use fire towers too often overall because I prefer to focus on slowing and debuffing the enemies as much as possible so that I can kill them with my own skills, but I am experimenting with using some fire towers a bit further out from the central point of the uh, blight encounter so that I can kind of thin the horde a little bit so to speak. Fire towers have also been handy in areas where I can't really keep an eye on easily or for example I don't have line of sight like there's a room somewhere where monsters are converging and I can't get there with my icicle mines. Knowing what the towers do and comboing and placing them well is key in the blighted maps because they are super hectic. You'll have a lot of lanes to watch in these maps and they'll often come from different directions, so good placement and choices of towers are crucial. Indoor maps are actually easier overall I've found in many cases because of natural choke points they create and better grouping of the tendril lanes. Now blight maps can be crafted and chiseled like normal maps, though I'd avoid monster move speed and boss life if you want a solid shot at winning, those are pretty brutal mods on these. When you win the map you get some drops from whatever you kill at the end, but to get all of the juicy chests you need to actually win by surviving for 5 minutes and killing all of the remaining monsters. You can also anoint blight maps with oil, and uh, this is actually pretty worth doing. The clear oil slows monsters down and adds pack size so it makes it easier overall, while the sepia oil adds tower damage and pack size. These can be pretty good and are potentially worth using, since the blight maps are proving to be fairly high value and fairly rewarding, but be a little bit careful of going too hard on the pack size if you're not sure you can win yet. When you start the blight map encounter, check the resistances, that's the first thing you want to do. If there is a lot of one type of resistance, make sure to avoid building too many of those tower types. If you find yourself often kind of just relying on one specific tower, then you may get screwed when you run into one with a bunch of resistances, so be sure to mix it up. If there are a mixture of resistances and not too many of any one type, then you'll be fine with just a regular mix of towers, which is a good part of any strategy anyway. I typically start the map by trying to build a decent kill box or choke point if I can find a spot where that could happen, and then I use some minions and ice towers to kick things off. At this point I'll also plot out some good spots for potential shock or physical towers as well. More lanes will be added throughout the fight, so don't concentrate too much in one area early on as you may find yourself getting flanked. I found it makes it much easier if you build many tier 1 towers early, as it's much easier to spam the upgrades when the fight gets hectic than it is to place new towers. So if you have them all plotted out, you can just kind of upgrade them as the fight's going. And do your best to spend all your points. It gets a bit hard sometimes if tower locations are far away and there's a lot of enemies down there and you're trying to fight yourself. But that's part of the gameplay here. If you find yourself losing blight maps with several thousand points banked, then ultimately you know exactly why you lost, so that's the thing to work on. It's a bit like playing an RTS, the classic strategy, spend your resources and always be making something. 
Anyway, folks, I hope you have found this helpful. If you have any questions or want to share some of your own strategies, hit us up in the comments below. That's it for now. I'm Ziggy D, and thanks for watching.